What if everything you got came with a little bit of money? Spicy chicken ramen with a side of quarters, a full tank of gas, and a $5 bill, an entire pantry's worth of groceries, and a pocket full of cash. Well, then you'd be living life on the upside. The first platform that gives you real cash back in real life wherever you roll. Restaurants, grocery stores, gas stations, all cash back opportunities. So order the expensive appetizer, buy a little extra at the store, fill your gas tank till the pump stops. Because with Upside, you can. Start earning cash back just for doing you. Download the free Upside app and use promo code SPICY for an extra $10 cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's promo code SPICY, promo code SPICY, SPICY for an extra $10 on the free Upside app. Start living life on the Upside with the free Upside app. Hello, and welcome to episode 22 of Real Life Ghost Stories. We are back. We've had a really busy week in terms of admin. We've got loads of stuff done. We have. We set up a new Facebook page. We, well, an actual proper Facebook page. I mean, we. Is we, 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 we as in I. <laughs> a proper Facebook page, so go and give us a like on there and leave us a little review. Thank you to all of those who have already done it. It's pretty amazing. And we also set up our Patreon. So to kick off our episode today, we want to say thank you to our amazing Patreon pledgers. Thank you to Ilse Rodriguez. Thank you to Nick Gordon. To Susan Porter. To Will Golder. Sinead Hanna. To Sarah. My lovely sister, by the way. <laughs> to Anna Caredio. To Penny. I've definitely got the easier names Yeah, here. you do have the easier <laughs> names. Thanks. To Chloe O'Loughlin. To Andrea Nelson. Alina Embry. Uh, Lizzie Winkworth, which is a great name. Anna Nastasi. To Mitch. Dave Keane. Uh, Claire Cunningham. Pabla Andrade. Christina Smith. And Carmen Tisdale Burgess. Thank you so much. We can't believe that people have actually donated. I genuinely didn't think anybody would. And it means that when payday comes around, as in the Patreon payday, I will actually be able to buy pop cards. Yay. Oh, who knew? Who knew? And we also, you know, need to think about buying new microphones because I dropped one into a pint glass. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Yeah. And somebody messaged me being like, in your Patreon episode, or in your questions and answers episode, there's like this weird static and it's really strange. And I was like, no, no, I, I dropped I dropped the mic into yeah, a pint glass yeah. of water. So, that does happen. oops. Oops. So, thank you so much. I cannot believe people donated. I genuinely didn't think they would. And I'm really touched that people would, would actually care enough to, to donate to us. And if you donate, you get access to exclusive episodes. So, that's quite a cool, cool thing to be able to do and a cool thing to be able to have. So, thank you so much. That's enough about Patreon. Yes. But if you want to donate, go find us on Patreon. We are there. Our promo today... Do, do, do. which i'm really excited about is the demon gin and the demon gin are a dark folk band they are based in canterbury they are made up of gorgeous Sinead, gorgeous ben and greg who did the music for our podcast indeed and we had the pleasure of going to see them last weekend what did you think they were brilliant really good sort of like storytelling to music good red up lighting yeah nice nice light setup as well yeah. so they they take folklore they take mythology they take history they take weird societal expectations and turn them into songs so we're not going to play the promo now we're going to leave it until the end of the episode so if you stay tuned at the end of the episode you'll be able to hear an exclusive song from the demon gin and go and follow them on facebook go and follow them on instagram go to their website find them on soundcloud they are amazing our film review this week is as above so below it was released in 2014 it has an imdb rating of 6.2 out of 10 and a rotten tomatoes rating of 26 percent. there's a huge Ooh, disparity a big, there that's a big disparity would you like a synopsis i would like a synopsis yes miles of twisting catacombs lie beneath the streets of paris the eternal home to countless souls when a team of explorers ventures into the uncharted maze of bones they uncover the secret of what this city of the dead was meant to contain a journey into madness and terror. As above, so below, reaches deep into the human psyche to reveal the personal demons that come back to haunt us all. 
I have so much to say about this film. What were your thoughts? It did reach deep into the human psyche because I had no fucking clue what this film was about. I can't believe you just swore. I know. <laughs> oh my words. That's how much, that's how strongly you feel about it. Uh, I didn't dislike it, but I was really confused, like really confused by the end of it. I have no idea what the point of the story was. So it's about a woman that goes looking for the Philosopher's Stone, which I thought was something to do with Harry Potter, but apparently it's not. I mean, it is also to do with Harry Potter. It's not mutually exclusive. You know, Harry Potter can use it. This film can use it badly. It's fine. And then she don't really find it. She goes underground looking for it. She finds it. And then it turns out that she hasn't found it because she is the Philosopher's Stone. Yeah, I think But then that. we don't really get any, like, round up and then end up going back, coming back through a hole upside down. That's kind of it, really. That's just, that's what happens. I thought it was, I I thought, so there's so many points where I was like, oh, this is clever. I can see where this is going. And then it didn't go where I thought it was going to go. So I thought they were doing like a Dante's seven levels of hell. Yeah. So I was counting the levels down thinking, all right, they're going to get to hell at some point. And they didn't. They just came out back out into the street of Paris, just upside down. I thought it was going to be like an allegorical look at greed. And that was what made them descend into the seven levels of hell. Because they do go down. They keep going further and further underground. And there's loads of different, like you said, loads of different pathways that it could have taken, but just none of them were executed very well. And I think that it was a good idea, but it was really sloppily written. So, like, there was a bit where they were underground and they get lost. And, like, the catacombs of Paris are really notorious for being haunted anyway. And it was, the catacombs were set up because they had so many deaths in the city that they didn't know what to do with their bodies. So they just put them underground. They're still there to this day and you can go and visit them. Like, there's one point where they're lost in the ground and a phone starts ringing. That was quite creepy. And I was, we were like, what yeah. the fuck? Why is there a phone underground? Don't answer the phone. Don't answer the phone. Why would you answer the underground phone? She answers the phone. I think it was supposed to be like her dead dad talking to her, but that was never explained. No. And then they find a piano, which this guy was like, oh, we had a piano just like this when I was a kid. And this key doesn't work. And lo and behold, the key doesn't work. So he's like, this is my piano. But no, nothing is explained. So confusing. Like, so why, confusing. I why thought, it happened is baffling. I thought it was going to be a creature feature at first, like the descent. I thought there was going to be like people living underground. Mm. And then, then I was like, oh, no, no, this is going to be a haunted thing because there's like Satanists running around in white paint. And then they didn't really reappear again. And then there wasn't really any ghost things. And then they just kept getting turned around and confused. Then a couple of people died. And then, but I just didn't really understand it. We'd, there was like, it started in Syria and she saw this hanging She's in man. Iran. Iran. That's no, she went over the border from Syria, that's why. Oh, yeah. She was in Iran and she saw this man hanging and there was no explanation of who he was or why there was a man hanging and they just kind of skirted over it and then the hanging man reappears later on and you kind of get a semi-explanation and then you think she's got the stone then she is the stone and then they don't get any explanation for that and then you think the token black guy's going to die and then he die first and he doesn't. And he dies second. second. <laughs> It's just re- it's just a really confusing film, and it had like the vibe at the start. It had like a vibe of like a, a national treasure or like a Tomb Raider Indiana Jones or Indiana kind Jones of vibe, kind of thing. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I can get down with this if it's got a few jump scares in it. And then it just went off for that as well. And I, I very very confused by it. I still like was mildly entertained by it, but I was so confused. Somebody messaged the Facebook group, and they were like, "I mean, I know Dan's gonna like it." <laughs> Well, I did kind of. But I'm interested to hear what you think. And um, do you know what I think? I think it was shite. It was baffling. And it was just not very well done. It had the potential to be brilliant. I do think it was shite. I think it was terrible because nothing was explained. There was no explanation as to why these things were happening. Like, even in things like, you know, the Blair Witch Project, where it is that found footage. It's a found footage film, by the way. So it's a found footage film. At least you still get the explanation as to what the Blair Witch is and what is what's going on even though there's no exposition from the characters you still know what's going on see the thing is i think they are presuming that you have a lot of knowledge about certain things so i think there is an explanation in there but i just don't have the background knowledge about alchemy and like mystics and stuff like that to understand what they were talking about and nicholas flamel and the philosopher's stone aside from harry potter yeah and so i think like it's lost on you if you just have no understanding of it i don't know i thought i was relatively intelligent until i watched this film and now i'm did you really think you were relatively relatively intelligent (laughs) But the other thing is it's handheld footage as well and I'm not I find them really difficult to watch but this one was okay actually after a while. Mm. What was weird about the whole handheld footage thing was that there was no visual of anybody passing the camera to anybody else but yet everybody's eye line seemed to be a camera at various points. 
Well, they had their, they got equipped with the head cams when they, they first the, went down. But I thought they were headlights, not No, head no, cams. they were head cams because oh, the guy was um, checking them, wasn't he, when they, and they were talking to each other. But there was a couple of moments where there was something going on in the shot with the three characters that were still alive, but someone was holding the, car- the camera and then the camera gets put down. And I don't know whether it was just poor editing, where obviously they've got a cameraman with them. Yeah. And they just forgot to put it down or what. There's a couple of moments, one where they're rescuing someone that's injured and the three people that are still alive are on the screen, but the camera is being held at head height and then it gets put on the ground and no one comes into shot and you just feel like, that's not supposed to happen. Yeah, what would you give it out of five? I'm going with two and a half. I'm going with two. I, I didn't like. I didn't want to turn it off. I just so it was. There was enough there to make me interested to see what would happen. I'm disappointed that there was no conclusion, but I kept watching it till the end. I think there was just too many elements in it for it to be good. So you know, when you had like the whole spooky thing going on, when you realise that everything's not as it seems, they had like satanist they had that weird hooded man they had that like jump scare with the scary woman yeah that actually scared me that yeah made, that made me jump <laughs> they had dead kids from the past they had that man who gets sucked into a burning car and then like ends up with just his legs in the concrete remember yeah, that yeah there was no justification no no but context. no explanation no context no explanation as to why this might have happened so i just think it was too messy and people seem to like people on facebook and people on instagram seem to have loved it but it's like I just didn't get it. Almost as if someone that has a niche knowledge of an understanding of this thing thought, Oh, I'll make this film, it'll be great and then just presumed that everybody has the same understanding as them. That's what I got from it. Because I was like, maybe this is perfectly logical if you know what you're talking about. I don't know. We're gonna move on because I I could talk about this forever about how terrible it was. This week at Macy's, get an extra 20% off with your coupon or Macy's card. That's on top of already great deals, like 25 to 60% off cold weather gear for the whole family, 30 to 60% off select bedding and bath, plus 30% off select small appliances. And Star Rewards members earn on every purchase, except gift cards, services, and fees at Macy's, Macy's Backstage, and Market by Macy's. More at Macy's.com slash Star Rewards. Savings off sale and clearance prices. Exclusions apply. We've got three stories this week. Great. And they are all transport-based stories. Oh, is it like that episode of Supernatural with the haunted truck that goes around killing people? Kind of. I didn't really watch that episode, so I don't really remember what the outcome of it was. So we've got three stories, transport-based, and this was came from a suggestion from one of our Patreon subscribers. And I was like, oh, I don't know this story. Then I looked it up and then I was like, let's have a theme of transport-based haunting. So we've got a ghost ship. We've got a haunted flight Mm -hmm. and we've also got a haunted car Mm. three different stories are you ready for story number one never ready go for it let's do this depending on which report is accurate a curious radio message was received by numerous ships traveling along the straits of malacca situated around sumatra and malaysia in either june 1947 or as late as february 1948 do you know what i love a story with glaring inconsistencies (laughs) from the offset that makes me happy At the time, the origins of this message and SOS were not known. The message itself was divided into two parts, separated by Morse code that could not be deciphered. Those that received this message insisted that the transcript went. All officers, including the captain, are dead, lying in chart room and bridge, possibly whole crew dead. I die. Nothing else was transmitted after this chilling conclusion. Two ships, both American, picked up the messages and felt compelled to investigate. With the help of British and Dutch listening posts, the coordinates of the vessel thought to be transmitted were triangulated. It was the Dutch freighter SS Aurang Madan, an American merchant ship. The Silver Star was sent to the coordinates. Given the content of the distress calls, the captain of the Silver Star wasted no time in navigating to the new heading. Several hours later, the lookout on board the Silver Star spotted the stricken Aurang Madan. Even as the rescue ship pulled alongside, no signs of life could be seen visually. All efforts to contact the crew failed, forcing the captain of the Silver Star to organise a search party. The moment that the search party boarded, it was obvious that the messages were horribly accurate. The decks of the Aurang Madan were littered with the corpses of the Dutch crew. The victims were found wide-eyed with terror and their faces twisted into sheer horror, arms trying to fight off... something. Not even the ship's dog escaped the terror of whatever had taken place. The canine was discovered to be in the midst of snarling at the cause. The captain was found, as one might have expected, on his bridge. The remainder of the bridge officers were found in the wheelhouse and the chart room. The radio operator who presumably sent the distress call was found at his station. 
The engineering crew was also found at their stations with precisely the same expressions on all of their faces. During the search efforts, the rescue party noticed several things that struck them as odd or strange. The local temperature was in excess of 100 degrees Fahrenheit, but members of the team felt an ominous chill emanating from somewhere. Another oddity was the condition of the victims. All of them had suffered, but none had any injuries to note. They were also decaying quicker than they should be. The ship itself didn't appear to have suffered any damage. When the search party returned to the Silver Star, the decision to tow the Aurang Wadan for salvage was quickly taken. It was only when the ships were tethered together that smoke was discovered below decks, specifically the number 4 cargo hold. Within seconds of the tow rope being severed, the Aurang Wadan exploded with enough force to lift it out of the water before sinking to the seabed. The first official mention of the incident was made by the United States Coast Guard in May 1952. In addition to the witness testimony of the state of the crew themselves, the published account added that they were all found with their faces frozen, upturned to the sun, staring as if in fear, the mouths were gaping open and the eyes staring. One of the arguments cited against this ever taking place was the registry of the Aurang Medan. Officially speaking, it appears as though it never actually existed, although the Silver Star was a real vessel. But at the time, the Aurang Medan was supposed to have been floundering, the Silver Star was operating under another registration, Santa Juana. The Grace Line Shipping Company had bought rights to the ship and renamed it. In contrast, those that believed Aurang Medan's story insist that the ship was registered in Sumatra. At the time, Sumatra was a Dutch colony that formed part of what was known as the Dutch East Indies. In Indonesian, Aurang means man and Medan is the largest city on the island of Sumatra. Hence, the registered name Aurang Medan literally means man from Medan. No records have been produced to back up this claim. Even Lloyd's shipping registers and the Dictionary of Disasters at Sea from 1824 to 1962 has found no mention of the Aurang Medan. Professor Theodore Searsdorfer of Essen in Germany has spent much of the last 50 years researching the story of the Aurang Medan. Searsdorfer was the first to mention the names of the American ships that originally went in pursuit of the Aurang Medan and refers anyone interested in their own research to a German booklet written in 1954. The author of this publication was a man called Otto Melke and seemed to know a lot about the mysterious ship. Not just the route it took, but the cargo it carried and the name of the captain. This booklet established the date as June 1947 and is often rumoured to have been authenticated by a crewman aboard the Silver Star. It was also this booklet that mentioned the cargo hold and what might have been stored inside. According to this booklet, the cargo holds contained potassium cyanide and nitroglycerin. If this is actually true, then it could explain why there are no official records anywhere. Certainly having these combustible items on a rough sea is tantamount to negligence of the most severe kind. It could also explain the subsequent explosion shortly after the salvage attempt was made. There are those who speculate that the ship was actually carrying a far more sinister and altogether more dangerous cargo. Biological weapons manufactured by Japanese scientists as a result of the insidious experiments could well have been smuggled out of Japan. Known as Unit 731, it was designed to be a secret research and development facility meant to create the most dangerous chemical and biological weapons to help establish Japanese supremacy. Unit 731 was formed sometime in 1932 by a Japanese bacteriologist called Shiro Ishii who conducted terrible experiments during the Second World War. It is feasible that Unit 731 was smuggled on a nondescript merchant vessel with a foreign crew to avoid drawing unwanted attention to what was taking place. If so, what went horribly wrong? Comparisons to the Philadelphia experiment have been made by some ufologists. Wraiths have also been blamed for whatever happened on board the ill-fated ship. The unnatural deaths of the entire crew have lent some form of credibility to these and other causes that imagination have conjured up in the last half century. Even undead pirates, like the crew of the fictional Black Pearl, were blamed. Was the tragedy on the SS Aurang Medan a genuine event, or just a mariner seafaring tale designed to scare, frighten, or dissuade? My initial thought was the Black Pearl, but then I realised it's a little bit out of geographically wrong, because they're sort of Caribbean, hence Pirates of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So, I was thinking Sumatra, that area of Asia, what's around there that lives in the sea that could cause that kind of fear? Godzilla. My God, we need to contact that German professor who studied this his yeah. whole life. It's Godzilla. It's absolutely Godzilla. How did we not, how no. did I not think See, of this? Genius. 
So, yeah, if you want to give me more rewards, Spain. <laughs> it was Spain last time, wasn't it? It was Spain last uh, time. No, yeah, oh, I can see this being true to a point. So the lack of records for the Orang Madan. Yeah. If they've got stuff that they shouldn't have, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But it's the white star, it's the inconsistency with the White Star records, the one that supposedly went to them. Silver Star. Silver Star. See, that's why it's inconsistent. Yeah, because you're they got, inconsistent. They got the name wrong. Oh, I see. <laughs> it was actually the White Star. Oh, right. Okay. Um, no, the inconsistency of those records make me wonder whether it's actually just a old wives' tale. I like the Unit 731 theory. So in, during the Second World War, there was a Japanese concentration camp and it like that all that is true. And it was set up by this guy who wanted to, like in Auschwitz, he wanted to test the limitations of the human body. What he did there was absolutely horrific. So he special, specialised in extreme temperatures. So he purposely gave people frostbite. He froze people with nitroglycerin. He froze people with like varying methods and tried to figure out how to reverse it. So he did it essentially to prisoners of war. He inf- he infected people with various sexually transmitted diseases to see what happened. If it, oh my, like absolutely horrific the things that were done there. And then when America found out about it, they went, well, we're not going to do anything if you give us all of the results of your findings. So the result of Unit 731 was that we learned about frostbite. We learned about how to reverse the effects of things, but there was no repercussions for the absolutely horrific human rights violations that were done there. And America signed a contract with Japan saying, we're we're not going to do anything. You just need to give us everything that you've discovered so actually mm. the the trading of or the, the the shipping of things from asia to america actually would make sense yeah and that would explain why the records weren't there on the american side of things either and that would explain why they all froze which yeah what seems that they and froze the ship probably never blew up did it probably, probably not. made its way back to america with the weapons scary thought when you think of mm. it like that isn't it not very um creepy but not very creepy, but interesting Sinister. historically. Yeah. And the yeah. only thing, so when people die, like we listen to the story and it says the dog died with a snarl on its face and blah, blah, blah. Like that doesn't happen when people die. So when people die, their muscles tense and then relax after a while. But actually if they were frozen. Yeah. If they had chemicals on board that were designed to freeze people and they did say that it was significantly colder on board the ship yeah. and they couldn't figure out why. And maybe they could see something. So maybe they could see like a cloud or something like that coming towards them hence the fear or they could see what was happening to everybody else around them yeah still and think they couldn't God, escape still it. think Godzilla's a more reasonable I think actually you're right I think it is Godzilla yeah just and they just died of fright so frozen in fear did he die of fright yeah your heart stops doesn't it oh okay that's the noise it makes it go <laughs> <laughs> I mean if if I have to choose another way other than Godzilla and then I'm probably with you actually that it's probably all a bit undercover but they probably did get a message like that, but then they probably got another message from the government saying, you need to get this back and move it. But then again, there's slowly. also the possibility that it is just an old wives' tale. It is a seafaring tale. Because the sea is full of ghost stories, isn't it? Yeah, but it's because it's full of ghosts. <laughs> I'm not laughing. I know, sorry, sorry, it's not funny. Sea ghosts are not funny. They're not to be laughed at. You ready for story number two? Uh, yep, go for it. This story is more of a paranormal story. And this is the story of Haunted Flight 401. 1972 was drawing to a close when a routine flight from JFK, New York to Miami departs at 9.20pm with 30-year veteran pilot Captain Bob Loft at the controls. The other flight crew members were First Officer John Stockhill, a flight engineer, and Donald Louis Repo, an aircraft mechanic and flight engineer. There were 10 flight attendants in the main cabin, serving 163 passengers. Eastern Airlines Flight 401 encountered no problems while cruising between the two cities. Flight 401's chain of problems began on the approach to Florida two hours after departure. The aircraft, a Lockheed L-10111 TriStar jet, seemed to have an issue with the front nose gear. The signal inside the cockpit had not illuminated as it should have. Despite the crew's attempts to lower the landing gear, the signal that it was down and locked failed to appear. Loft abandoned the landing and informed air traffic control of the issue. ATC put the plane into a holding pattern over the Everglades. On board the aircraft, all members of the flight crew worked solely on the problem. With the autopilot engaged, the malfunctioning light was dismantled by two members of the crew. 
The third, Repo, used the porthole to try and get a visual of the gear. It was quite possible that the landing gear was actually in the correct configuration. The lack of confirmation from the interior landing light signal so consumed the entire crew's attention that nobody noticed that one of them had inadvertently switched off the autopilot. Worse, none of them noticed that the jet had been steadily losing altitude. Hang on a second. Let's pause briefly. (laughs) How does nobody notice that you've accidentally turned off autopilot on a fucking airplane? And how does nobody notice that you are steadily losing altitude? It's quite concerning, isn't it? Outside of the aircraft, there wasn't much in the way of visual clues, and the city lights were non-existent. The crew did finally notice the situation taking place, but nowhere near in time to prevent the inevitable. Flight 401 crash-landed into the Everglades at over 200 miles an hour. According to the National Transport Safety Board, the main fuselage broke into four sections and many other smaller pieces on impact. This killed the first officer instantly. Burning jet fuel engulfed the aircraft as it ploughed through the swamp. The aircraft disintegrated, scattering wreckage over an area of approximately 1,600 feet long by 300 feet wide. The NTSB also reported that 67 passengers survived the carnage and 94 perished, as did two of the cabin crew. Captain Bob Loft survived the impact but was so severely injured that he died during the rescue efforts. Don Repo survived long enough to reach the hospital but he also proved to be too badly injured. Not long after the devastating crash, stories began to emerge in the Eastern Airlines community of unexplained encounters with some of the crew from Flight 401. Flight crews and passengers on other similar aircraft in the Eastern Airlines fleet came forward with stories of sightings of Bob Loft and Dan Repo. At first, witnesses reported nothing more severe than standing in the aisles occupying the galley and the cockpit. Reports began to take on a much more sinister overtone, at least in the eyes of the witnesses involved. This witness, a female passenger, described an ashen-looking person sitting in one of the seats. She described him as being dazed and unresponsive. She was so worried about his appearance that she summoned an attendant to investigate further. The man vanished before their very eyes and those of several other passengers. The original witness was so distressed that several of the cabin crew had to forcibly restrain her. It took a while, but the female passenger eventually calmed down. She was shown photos of several of the flight staff and she picked out Don Repo as being the man who sat in the chair. This is not the only registered sighting. Another flight was being subjected to pre-flight checks when Bob Loft was spotted wandering around the undercarriage. Loft even spoke to the ground crew, insisting that no checks were required as he had already done them. The pilot of this flight was so unnerved that he cancelled the flight. Captain Bob Loft is often earmarked as the notorious subject of this haunting, but the truth is that Don Repo is far more active and far more regularly witnessed. One time a working flight attendant insisted that she saw an engineer working to repair an oven. When word of this reached the only engineer on board of that particular flight, he denied ever fixing the oven, and went so far as to say as it didn't even need fixing in the first place. As in other reports, the flight attendant selected Repo's photo from a choice offered to her. Another pilot on another flight was seriously concerned when he heard knocking coming from beneath the cockpit himself. Worried that something was wrong with the aircraft or one of its systems, the pilot opened up the compartment trap door. Imagine his surprise when he came face to face with Don Repo. Surprise turned to horror when Repo literally disappeared before the pilot's eyes. Undeterred, the pilot investigated further and did find a problem that may have caused a serious accident if it went unnoticed. Repo seemed to have a knack of turning up in the oddest of places. A crawl space beneath a cockpit is one thing. A galley oven is quite another. An attendant of TriStar 318 was so shocked to see Repo looking back at her through the oven that she called other members of the cabin crew to confirm the sighting. The flight engineer on duty during this flight was a personal friend to Repo and instantly recognised the face as that of his deceased friend. According to all present, Repo then warned them about a fire on board. At the time, not much notice was taken. Later on during the flight, though, problems with the engine all stemmed from a fire that nobody knew about. The final leg of the flight was cancelled as a result of this fire. Witnesses include pilots, various other members of Eastern Airlines staff and their passengers. One other witness has also come forward with a similar story that adds validity to the others simply because of who he was at the time. 
Bob Loft appeared before the vice president of Eastern Airlines in first class. The pair conversed briefly before Loft faded from sight. At first, the VP just assumed that this was the captain of the flight he was on. I'm sorry, who has the ability to disappear? I don't think this witness has any more validity than anybody else because he's he thinks... He's been taking full advantage of the first class benefits, clearly. Because he thinks that humans have the ability to just fade from sight in midair. Many of the accounts share similar characteristics. Whenever either Loft or Repo make an appearance, they tend to be lifelike and look just like another person. More than a single person has often been present at the time, whether by accident or by design. One curious aspect of these sightings is that the people always saw one or the other. Loft and Repo have never been reported on the same flight by the same witnesses at the same time. Another link between the sightings and the aircraft involved could be the corporate decision to use the undamaged parts of Flight 401 on other jets in the fleet. Some believe that Eastern Airlines cannibalised and reused pieces of the wreckage in other airliners. If this was true, then perhaps they recycled more than just aircraft parts. Officially, Eastern Airlines denied anything was wrong with their aircraft or personnel. At no time would officials of the company allow or condone any attempt to investigate the reports. While all this was very much in the public domain, reports circulate that aircraft engineers quietly removed any materials they had rescued from the crash. The sightings apparently stopped once all this was done. The company folded in 1991 and is perhaps still better known for some of the more compelling and credible paranormal encounters to date. With their very careers on the line, each witness must be totally certain what they saw is what they saw, and that alone adds to the credibility of their accounts. Dun, dun, dun. Can we discuss the fact that if you're going to reuse parts from an airplane that has crashed and killed loads of people, then fuck me, you deserve to be haunted. Yes. You deserve to have a man in your oven. Yes. I think they actually probably did recycle Oh, they probably did, yeah. Which is horrific because the plane crashed. So probably should just leave it, scrap it, not put it back in the air again. But maybe they're like opposing forces. So maybe the captain, Bob... Laughed. Bob Attic. um, Maybe maybe he is like the evil one. And the other one, Don Leto. Repo. Repo. He's like the good one. Because he seems to like try and warn them, doesn't he, when yeah. there's stuff going wrong. Whereas Bob Loft was like, oh yeah, I've checked this plane. Off you go. <laughs> Have at it. Off you go. See you later. <laughs> so maybe he's the one that's trying to get some, maybe he's trying to get some souls for the devil so he can get out of hell and the other one's doing an angel. All right, big jump there. Maybe the, other one's, some doing some the, angel, maybe the other one's doing the angel work. What do you think? Do you think they're real sightings? Yeah, I do. I think it's fair. I think I'm, I'm, I find this one difficult to debunk. But the thing that annoys me about it is the fact that every time somebody claimed to see something, they immediately showed them a lineup of photos of people yeah. that had died on the previous flight. If you show somebody photos of who of like suspects, they're more likely to pick somebody than pick nobody at all. So they're more likely to say, oh, it's that person, rather than saying, oh, no, it's none of those people. Yeah, and they're obviously trying to prove a point because they could have done it with like photos of random people, like not just the flight Yeah, group. exactly. Like, they could have done it with photos of random people. Yeah. And also, there was a man in the fucking oven. Yeah. What's How long was like, like in the oven? Yeah. So in the oven. Yeah. Imagine going to the oven and there's a man in the yeah, oven. Yeah, it's a ghost, isn't it? Yeah, I know that. But he stuck around long enough for her to go get other witnesses and then them to have a chat. Imagine how uncomfortable that must have been. He's a ghost. Smushed up in the he's oven. He's a ghost, he's all Yeah, right. but he's a human-sized ghost, isn't he? Yeah, it's maybe just... the oven's the recycled part from the flight. Oh, maybe. Because he seemed a bit obsessed with the oven because somebody else was <laughs> fixing the oven as well, inexplicably, weren't they? Maybe during the flight, he had like, you know, on flights where you get those horrible grilled cheese sandwiches or you get the horrible croissants with ham and cheese. Yeah. Maybe he had one of those in the oven when the flight was going down. Yeah. And that's, and he left his post to go get it. Yeah. Never got to have that sandwich. Yeah. Maybe he's just trying to get his sandwich back. I'd be really annoyed if yeah. I had food, if I died before my food arrived. But this is really, I don't like, this story is really creepy, I think. Why? Well, because it's like, like there's a massive like incident where loads of people died. Yeah. And then, like, there's oh, it's a bit Final Destination, isn't it? Popping up and saying, oh, no, something there's a fire. Or, like, knocking from underneath and then... That's like, horrible. Imagine yeah. being that cockpit. Or being that cockpit. But again... Being that... But that pilot then just went yeah, just open the undeterred. Hatch. Yeah, just open the hatch I'd door. be pretty yeah. deterred yeah. if I opened the cockpit hatch and a man appeared and then disappeared. <laughs> Why is everyone blindly accepting that humans disappear? The only one that reacted rationally to that was the woman who had to be physically yes. restrained. Everybody else is like, oh, wily humans. They get around so quick. The ability to operate is really quite astounding on flights nowadays. 
Whereas mm. she's like, fuck this shit, I'm out. And I understand. Yeah. Well. yeah, yeah, I'm not down with this story. I don't like it. I don't like the thoughts of all, thought of people reason parts of a plane that crashed I don't like the idea of planes crashing I don't like the idea of loads of people dying I don't like the idea of ghosts one people trying to kill you other people trying to save you I don't like it you sound a bit mental there <laughs> I am aren't I? yeah a little bit <laughs> and this leads us very nicely into our third story of today okay and I'm sure loads of people would have heard of it but it follows the same premise of reusing materials that you shouldn't reuse mm. and this is the legend of James Dean's little bastard of his illegitimate son no, oh. his car. Oh. The life and promising film career of the American actor James Dean was cut short by a fatal car accident in September 1955. Dean once said that he believed he was predestined to die in a speeding car, and the legend that grew up around the circumstances of his death attributes a curse on the car in which he met his violent fate. Following Dean's death, the curse affected others who came in contact with the wreckage. James Brian Dean, born February 8, 1931, in Marion, Indiana, rose to fame in the film industry as the prototypical disaffected, rebellious young man. His leading roles in East of Eden and Rebel Without a Cause turned him into a superstar. He never finished his last film, Giant, co-starring Elizabeth Taylor and Rock Hudson. It was completed without him following his death. Like his celluloid image, Dean liked to live on the dangerous, thrill-seeking edge. He loved fast sports cars and motorcycles. His favourite hobby was racing. He was a brilliant driver and performed well behind the wheel, taking top honours in his first several races. For most of the summer of 1955, Dean was on location near Marfa, Texas for Giant. His employer, Warner Brothers, fearful of a mishap, forbade him from racing during production. He did not, however, stop driving pell-mell on his own. After the location filming, Dean returned to Los Angeles, where his eye was caught by a new sports car, a silver-grey 1955 Porsche Spider. Thinking it would make a fine entry in upcoming races on October the 1st, he bought it, but on the condition that one of Porsche's top mechanics accompany him as a mechanic to all races, and the deal was struck. Although Dean was thrilled with the car, naming it Little Bastard, several of his friends allegedly were not. Ursula Andress, Alec Guinness, Nick Adams, star of TV series The Rebel, and George Barris, a car designer who had worked on Dean's other sports cars, all apparently expressed feelings of unease about the car. Guinness reportedly told Dean to get rid of the car, but to no avail. Barris said the car seemed to give off a weird feeling of impending doom. When Adams mentioned his own unease about the car to Dean, Dean shrugged it off, saying he was destined to die in a speeding car anyway. The final warnings of caution came from Dean's uncle, Charlie Nolan, just before Dean set out to drive to his next race. On the trip out of Los Angeles, the Porsche mechanic rode with Dean. They were followed much further behind by Bill Hickman, an actor friend of Dean, and Stan Roth, a photographer from Collier's, who planned a story on Dean at the races. Out on the open and nearly empty highway, Dean happily raced along. The car was topless, and the windshield had been replaced by a much smaller racing shield. At about 3.30, a highway trooper near Bakersfield pulled the speeding Porsche over and gave Dean a ticket. At Blackwell's Corner, a small road stop at the intersection of Route 466 and Route 33, Dean spotted a Mercedes-Benz 300 SL Gullwing sports car and stopped. The car belonged to Lance Reventlow, son of Barbara Hutton, heiress to the Woolworth fortune. Reventlow was also en route to the same races. After a short visit, Dean and the Porsche mechanic climbed back into Little Bastard and resumed their journey. They began the ascent of the Diablo Range Mountains. Meanwhile, travelling in the opposite direction in a Ford sedan was Donald Jean Turnipseed. (laughs) Like Johnny Appleseed. That's honestly his name, Turnipseed. Imagine. Cracking name. A student at California Polytechnic Institute who was driving home for the weekend... At 5.59pm, Dean's car bore down upon turnip speed as he attempted to make a left-hand turn across the highway. Faced with a split second to decide whether to accelerate or to swerve to avoid a collision, turnip speed did neither, but slammed on the brakes. Dean must have seen the appending crash, but was powerless to stop it. The two cars crashed head-on into each other. Dean was killed instantly, with a broken neck and other injuries. The Porsche mechanic was thrown free and suffered a fractured jaw, broken leg and internal injuries. The Porsche was badly mangled and nearly torn in two. Turnipseed suffered minor cuts but was not hospitalised. 
Dean's death stunned Hollywood. Then a subsequent series of macabre events gave rise to the legend that Dean's death car was somehow cursed. The incidents began after Barris bought the wreckage for its parts. Upon its arrival at Barris' garage, the wreck slipped during its uploading and fell on the mechanic, breaking one of his legs. Then two physicians, Troy McHenry and William F. Eskrid, bought the engine and drivetrain respectively to place in their own race cars. On October 2nd, 1956, both doctors then raced their cars in California using the little bastard parts for the first time. McHenry was killed when his car went out of control and struck a tree, and Eskrid was seriously injured when his car mysteriously rolled over going into a curve. Two of the little bastard's tyres were not damaged in the crash, and Barris sold both to a young sports car enthusiast. A few days later, the young man told Barris that both tyres had blown simultaneously, causing him to run off the road and very nearly wreck his car. Souvenir-seeking fans sought out the wreck at Barris's garage. One young man attempted to steal the steering wheel, ripped his arm open on a jagged piece of metal. At least one other person was injured while trying to steal pieces of blood-stained upholstery. Spooked by these incidents, Barris decided to store the wreck. He was persuaded by the California Highway Patrol, however, to allow the wreck to be used as part of a travelling highway safety exhibit. Two exhibits took place without incident, but prior to the third, in Fresno, the garage used to house Little Bastard went up in flames during the night. All vehicles inside were destroyed, except Little Bastard, that was barely touched in the fire. Wherever Little Bastard went, injury, death and mishap occurred. On display at the Sacramento High School, the car fell off its pedestal, breaking a student's hip. Later, the wreck was sent by flatbed truck to Salinas. En route, the driver lost control of the truck and was thrown free. The little bastard fell off the truck on top of him, crushing him to death. Two years later, on another flatbed truck, the wreck fell off and crashed onto the freeway, causing an accident. In 1958, yet another strange mishap took place. A truck carrying the car was parked on a hillside in Oregon. The brakes slipped and the truck crashed into a car, shattering its windows. Luckily, no one was hurt. In 1959, Little Bastard was sent to New Orleans for exhibit. While on display, it suddenly fell and broke into 11 pieces. Barris was unable to determine the cause of the breakage. The last mishap took place in 1960. Little Bastard was lent to the Florida Highway Patrol for a safety exhibit in Miami. Afterward, it was crated and placed onto a truck for return to Barris in Los Angeles. It never arrived. Somewhere out on the open road, it vanished. Those who believe in the curse of Little Bastard also point to the workings of misfortune in the lives whom Dean knew. Nick Adams, who dubbed the voice for Dean in several scenes of Giant, died in 1968 of an overdose. In the same year, the Porsche mechanic who travelled with Dean was convicted of murdering his wife and sentenced to life in prison. He pled insanity at his trial. Lance Reventlow was killed in a plane crash. Dean's co-star in Rebel Without a Cause was stabbed to death in 1976. Was the little bastard cursed when Dean bought it, even though it was brand new? Or did it become cursed as a result of his violent death? According to superstition, objects, as well as places, can become cursed when they are associated with violence and tragedy. If Dean truly was destined to lose his life in a car crash, then perhaps any car that became the death vehicle might have become cursed. According to psychometry, objects absorb the emotions of their owners and those around them, and remain a repository of these emotions indefinitely. Is it possible that the final, blinding, terrible seconds of James Dean's life, he experienced emotions of such intensity that they were literally seared into his car, along with the violence of his death? The answer will remain forever a mystery. So what do you think? That's a great story. I like that. I like anything old Hollywood anyway. This is a very sinister edge to it. Like, uh, it was a bit Final Destination-y again, isn't it? Because, like, he knew he was going to die in a I wreck. Know. And he said he was, t- he kept telling everybody that he was going to die in a... But I guess if you race a lot in that era, at high speed, actually, the, the chances of dying in a high speed... And not only just racing in, in high speed, but actually driving around in your normal life yeah. at high speed. Yeah. The chances are pretty high that you're going to die in a wreck. Yeah. So I don't think he's, like, predicting his own death in that yeah. regard. I think he was just kind of joking to those people who are like oh that car is a bit dodgy he's like well I'm going to die in a car crash anyway yeah. so whatever yeah but this I like the way that the, there's like people had sort of like oh, bad feelings about the cars but you have to wonder don't you about how much of that is hindsight rather than yeah it? probably yeah. I think it's a I think it's a apart story apart from Guinness obviously because he's Obi-Wan Kenobi so he knew everything in advance anyway clearly he had the, mm. he had the force yep. but I think that there's a lot of lore grows up around these stories anyway especially when somebody famous dies yeah 
Like, if I was Barris, the guy who took the car to salvage it and, and sell the parts, just fucking put it in storage in the first place. If, like, why would you salvage parts from a car? Well, you know why, because he wants to make money from it. Yeah. And, like, all these mad people are breaking in to try and steal some of the bloody upholstery. Yeah, but I guess James, James Dean's one of those first sort of, like... Teen idols, isn't he? So Hard the props. devotion. Like if you think about all the mad crap that went on with the Beatles and like the lengths that people would go to to get stuff for the beat, I do get it. Like I understand it. But I mean, if you're gonna go like nicking something from a wreck of a car, you're probably gonna get sliced open. Like yeah. that's just an inevitability. But all the other accidents is quite. I don't know. It's, just, it's quite. There's quite an eerie sort of undertone to it, like sinister. Like it was they were driving in the Diablo Mountains and. Yeah, I like the fact that yeah. it was the Diablo Mountains. That's all a bit. Not that I liked it. I mean, the man died. It's awful. Yeah. But I also feel like everyone needed to learn how to appropriately display that car because it fell so many times. Yeah. Why did nobody know how to like strap it down? What what were they? What were they? They Just put some chucks on the wheel. What were they displaying it on? (laughs) I don't know. Like a a six foot pedestal. Why did it keep falling down and hurting people? Well, because it was the devil in the form of a car. Oh, I see. Yeah. The devil in one of his well-known forms, yeah, and that's a horse spider. But can, can we just uh, can we just point out the fact that that car did not go missing? The delivery driver no, nicked it. Obviously, it didn't disappear. <laughs> if you knew you were transporting James Dean's car that he died in, for God's sake, that car still exists somewhere in somebody's personal collection. Yeah, absolutely. That's where that is. Absolutely, it w- disappeared. Yeah. Get an absolute grip. Unless it was the devil. Unless Barris just wanted to get rid of it because it was having, like... Yeah. Like, there was so much press, obviously, had grown up around it, but it was all really negative. Like, yep. people were getting hurt and injured because of this car, unless he was like, oh, no, it disappeared. When it actually didn't. Yeah. Of course it didn't. I do like the... I, I do like this sort of idea of it, of it being an age where highway safety units would display actual wreckages. I think that's cars. a great idea. It's brilliant, isn't it? Like, if you're ever going to s- deter people from speeding especially young people yeah. you go you know james dean oh you loved him oh you loved him he's dead see that car he died in it <laughs> that's how you stop people from speeding but then you never you don't have that here but like the car advertisements the anti-speeding advertisements in ireland are absolutely horrific yeah i saw some when I oh when you were in house, ireland yeah. yeah they're absolutely yeah, horrific they're really 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 horrific. really gruesome yeah Whereas here they don't really exist, which is a, which no. is a, I thought I was fine. Well, we had strange. we had we did have a bit of a run of them in the sort of nineties, particularly at school. But they were all very um, I don't know they weren't as like hard hitting as the Irish yeah. ones. And... So our three transport stories today. Do you think that vehicles can be haunted? Like, do you do you believe in ghost ships? Do you think that that flight or not the flight was haunted, but the subsequent flights afterwards were haunted? Oh, well, the sea is full of ghosts. As we've already established full of ghosts just swimming yeah. around. And I think the ocean is one of the most mysterious places on Earth. Actually, don't they say that we know more about space than we do mm. about the ocean? And I, I just don't think we actually know what happens, especially like really vast open. But like the Pacific scares the hell out of me. That place, like I don't mind the Atlantic so much. Okay, well, listen. If we're going to give give our top oceans, <laughs> no, because the, 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 Atlantic, the one? Atlantic's kind of bookended, doesn't it, between like Europe and and North America. So mm-hmm. you, there's like a very. Whereas I just feel like the Pacific is kind of, even though it's got the same bookend, there's so many little like places and little islands in the ocean, and it's it seems so much faster to me. I do believe that there are creatures in the ocean, big enormous creatures that God- we don't know. Godzilla, about. not probably not Godzilla. Definitely the Meg, though. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, no, I think there are ghost ships. I don't know whether that story is a ghost ship story necessarily. I think if it's going to be anything, if the story is real, it's going to be a conspiracy cover up, theory yeah. cover up yeah. type thing rather Absolutely. than anything else. But I do believe in ghost ships. I think the Mary Celeste is just like a legit thing. Ah, oh, see, I don't know if I do because I think the sea is a very. It must be a very lonely place if you are a sailor, mm. and it must be a very bizarre feeling to just to know that you have nowhere to go you are but there's stuck also on that like vessel. loads and loads of people lost at sea so like yeah that's in true. terms of energy and stuff yeah maybe it's quite possible to and like the things like the can we do an episode on the bermuda triangle at some point yeah of course we can because that's Very that quiet, fascinates lately. me Nothing really happens in the yeah but it fascinates me that does and like um the god land like all the kind of stuff that goes on the sea is really like scary but i don't think that particular story is is paranormal i think that's probably explainable if it's real and i think it is real actually I don't know. I'm in um, two minds about it. But yeah, I think you can. I, d- I think it I, It makes sense that like, if you're thinking in terms of energy, that things, that machinery or equipment that was part of 
or responsible for the death or the high intensity tragic death of someone or lots of people could carry that energy with it and i think like i don't think the flight for what was it flight 401 flora flight 401 was cursed i think it was more a case of haunting on it but i think little bastard might have been cursed you know well you never know yeah you i feel like know. that's more of a cursed one because you know you have um like people do put curses on people yeah. like whether or not you believe in them is yeah. a completely different thing but if you are interested in the world of curses look up romanian witches they are a thriving modern day business and people pay them to put curses on people. So people yeah. believe in curses and yeah. they are a real thing. Absolutely. You've got to look at like New Orleans. You've got to look yeah. at um, African football teams. Like the, they ban witch doctors from international competitions. I in love it. Africa. I just, we, we need to do a, an episode. We've, yeah. We have an episode in the lineup or in well, the, I actually in think the pipeline. That, I do you actually think that was a cursed car. And how do you know? Like, I, I always go, yeah, yeah, I always got a f- people that come into fame out of nowhere as well. Illuminati. Saw that Robert Johnson stuff, you know. Who's Robert Johnson? He's the bluesman that made a pact at the devil. Uh, pact with the devil at Crossroads. Oh, and then, yes. Yeah. Yeah, gave the devil his soul so that he yeah. would be rich and famous. And then died. So you never know, maybe James Dean is the same. Maybe the, the spider was the devil. Maybe. Spy- maybe maybe you were right. Mm. We've got two new reviews this week. Yeah. Our first review is shut the front door and have fun. While Emma tells ghost stories and reviews horror movies and makes concessions to es- extraterrestrial sightings and encounters, Dan offers insightful opinions on matters such as sinister children and probable commercial exploitation of scary trending topics. Binge listing is inevitable because of their accents and the stories are resistible. Irresistible. <laughs> <laughs> you can definitely resist these stories. Irresistible. <laughs> and that comes the whole way from Brazil. Wow. From... I'm going to say Apolido, but I'm not going to try and say your surname. I'm really sorry, but I just don't want to be offensive. And our second review is entitled First Podcast I've Ever Listened To and I Am Addicted. Pretty sure I've told Emma and Dan how much I love them and their podcasts on every single social media platform at this point. Started the binge, listened to the episodes and then realised I didn't have much left. So I slowed down so I wouldn't have too long to wait to listen to them again. Think that shows how much I love them. Creepy, but, but fun. Their accents just make it. Dan's reactions are my favourite and Emma's laugh is brilliant. Up the Irish. And that comes from Vader379, all the way from Ireland, hey. from home. Gurv Mila Mahagut Makara, Tatuga Holing. Something about your laugh, though, clearly, because it keeps, keeps yeah, cropping up. Yeah, keeps cropping up. up. I don't know what it is about my filthy. laugh. Filthy. <laughs> filthy, filthy laugh. So if you enjoyed this week's episode, please make sure that you follow us on Instagram. We are at Real Life Ghost Stories on Instagram. We are on Twitter. At Real Ghost Pod. And we are also on Facebook. We have an, a public Facebook page. Go and give us a like and drop us a little review. Thank you to those of you who've done it already. And please make sure that you join our secret Facebook group that you have to answer. Is it a secret? Is that what it's we called? We also have a secret. No, we have. It's, it's called... Closed. <laughs> It's co- it's a closed group that you have to answer a question. I like the idea of it being secret. Secret though. group. You have to find it. <laughs> like an Indiana Jones, as above, so below type quest. Come and join us in our secret Facebook group where we can have more open conversations about episodes and so on. And also, if you want to, subscribe to our Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash Real Life Ghost Stories. And to finish up today's episode, please stick around and listen to this absolutely stunning song from the Demon Gin. It is called A Victorian Dilemma. And if you can figure out what this song is about, can you please message me and let me know? And also go follow them here, there, and everywhere. They are absolutely amazing and I love them. And they do have EPs that you can buy. So please contact them if you would like to do that. And we shall see you next week. Goodbye. It started when I woke one day, I was 16 years old And I lit a candle by my bed and felt my blood run cold All the pieces of my puzzles, all my precious porcelain dolls And my needles and my knitting, they were piled up on the floor There was sulfur in the air that night and feathers crossed my bed And various obscenities were running through my head And the doer of these dreadful deeds, they returned every night But so familiar were they ways they filled me up with fright Ugh. Chide me, advise me, and scoff and scold Whatever you say, I will not be told Heavens hope you save me from myself today A 
the pressure mounting every day The sequence is the same To sing quietly, inquire of this thing that has no name But my mother will not answer me My father just ignores of the matter of my maiden itch That worries at my core But my library of Bibles say that praying is the cure Will you give in to your urges, you Madonna, oh you whore? Oh, pills and straps and straight jackets and sewing up my seam A course of shocking therapy, electric quarantine Whew. Chide me, advise me, and scoff and scold Whatever you say, I will not be told Heavens, earth, they save me from myself today The never-ending waiting for what is my wedding day To find myself a gentleman and let him have his way But decorum is demanding, I must let the man approach Be diverting, dear and dumb and deaf with no cause to reproach But too forward are my actions and too brash is my intent I need to find a husband and to feel his punishment Oh, the excellence of ecstasy, the epileptic fit Oh, the shattering of crystal and ripping my clothes to bits Chide me, advise me, and scoff and scold Whatever you say, I will not be told Heavens, earth, they save me from myself today I reach my hand into the void, the edges I explore Oh, the wire and the velvet and the beast beneath the floor So cavalier my innocence, it cannot be assured Oh, calamity of infamy of what they do abroad Is it sickness or insanity? I hear the bed and bells Will I sink or will I swim within the waters of my well? And will I be what I will be, the lion or the lamb? Will I fall into the little death and die by my own hand? <sighs> Chide me, advise me, and scoff and scold. Whatever you say, I will not be told. Heaven's open, save me from myself today. Uh, crackers, napkins, Clorox disinfecting bleach. Check. Now, roses... Uh, what if they wilt? Attention shoppers, Clorox disinfecting bleach is a great way to keep flowers fresh for longer. It'll even work for that uh, ink stain on your shirt. Ah, not again. Clean anything with the versatile Clorox disinfecting bleach. Discover more hacks at Clorox.com slash learn. What if everything you got came with a little bit of money? Spicy chicken ramen with a side of quarters, a full tank of gas, and a $5 bill, an entire pantry's worth of groceries, and a pocket full of cash. Well, then you'd be living life on the upside. The first platform that gives you real cash back in real life wherever you roll. Restaurants, grocery stores, gas stations, all cash back opportunities. So order the expensive appetizer, buy a little extra at the store, fill your gas tank till the pump stops. Because with upside, you can. Start earning cash back just for doing you. Download the free Upside app and use promo code SPICY for an extra $10 cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's promo code SPICY. Promo code SPICY. SPICY for an extra $10 on the free Upside app. Start living life on the Upside with the free Upside app. <laughs> 